introduction to the story. And because, you know, some of you may remember some of it, but not other, other parts. And um, this is really a story about the 1970s. And I started, uh, you know, I was alive in the 70s, but I was a kid, and I didn't really have a clear sense of what was going on. And I, I, I had the idea in my head that the 60s were the time of real uh, anger and craziness in this country. But the 70s, things sort of chilled out. Well, I could not have been more wrong. The 70s were a really extended nightmare in American life. In the early and mid-1970s, there were a thousand political bombings a year in the United States. Think about that. A thousand political bombings. Uh, you know, it was the Weather Underground, it was the Puerto Rican Nationalists, it was just an accepted form of political activity. Um, there were two hijackings a month through the early and mid-70s. Remember hijackings? And, um, you know, the, the, the idealism of the 60s that was reflected in the free speech movement in Berkeley or the Summer of Love in San Francisco curdled into this anger and frustration. And in the broader political culture, you know, you had Watergate and you had the energy crisis and gas lines. And um, a part of the anger in the counterculture, uh, especially in Northern California, was manifest in what became known as the prison movement. There was this sense that prisons were a center of political activity. And, and George Jackson was uh, a famous prisoner in Soledad Prison in California. And he um, led, a, led uh, you know, activists. And there were these kids uh, from Berkeley who would go to uh, the nearest state prison to Berkeley, which was Vacaville. And in Vacaville, they came across a guy named Donald DeFries. And Donald DeFries was a basically professional criminal. Of um, you know moderate to low, uh, you know he 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 was you know some small town time crimes, some big crimes, and he uh, was the, um, uh, the 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 person that they all fixated on. He wasn't particularly political, but he realized a good thing when he had it. He liked to hang out with these students. There were women there. There was there was sex going on in the prison. And, and he decided, you know, he was going to be the political activist that these students wanted him to be. Well, in mid-1973, in mid he gets transferred to Soledad Prison, and then he escapes. He escapes from Soledad and goes the only place he knows where he will have a um, welcome, and that's Berkeley, to his old friends, and that's where he starts to create the Symbionese Liberation Army. Now, Symbionese, what, is, what does that word mean? Um, Donald DeFries came up with that word. It's a made up word derived from symbiosis. And uh, you know, he called it a liberation. They didn't liberate anything or anyone. He called it an army. There were at most about a dozen people in it. So the, the name is triply misleading. Once he gets to Berkeley, he fixates on a local leader. Marcus Foster, a really heroic person, African-American school educator who was the school superintendent in Oakland. And DeFries gets it into his head that uh, Foster is a sellout and that uh, he is um, a betrayer of the black community. And in November of 1973, Foster and two of his followers in the in Coet SLA, uh, assassinate Marcus Foster. They shoot him dead outside the school board building in, in Oakland. A crime of such madness that, uh, uh, that even the Black Panthers uh, find it repulsive and, 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 and want no part of it. Shortly after the SLA uh, assassinates Marcus Foster, they get reinforcements from a peculiar source, from the Indiana University Theater Program. <laughs> Three people from the Indiana University, Bill and Emily Harris and Angela Atwood, join the SLA. And they bring a real 
sensibility. It was the time of guerrilla theater, political theater, and they wanted to turn the SLA into something that would generate lots of attention. And they thought that murder was probably not the best idea because it did, hadn't worked out so well. But they thought, what about kidnapping? And, and two of the SLA members had, were arrested in January of 1974. And they thought, I know, maybe we'll try to kidnap somebody and then trade them for our two comrades. It was a lunatic idea. I mean, Ronald Reagan, the governor of California, was not going to trade accused murderers for anybody. But they thought, OK, let's try to do a kidnapping. Well, just by coincidence, in the beginning of, two, uh, the beginning of 1974, um, there was a wedding announcement in the San Francisco Examiner. Patricia Hearst and Stephen Weed were getting married. Now, this was a big deal because uh, the Hearst owned the Examiner. And, the, and you know, does, does anyone here in this audience remember newspapers? <laughs> um, they used to be a really big deal, especially in, San you know, in, 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 in the early 70s. And, and the Hearst name, um, was, was, you know, resonant of power and wealth. You know, William Randolph Hearst, Patricia's grandfather, was um, one of the richest men in the world. He built the grandest residence in all of America, San Simeon. His life was the uh, model for perhaps the greatest American movie ever made, Citizen Kane. And, and, and so this drew the attention of the SLA, this wedding announcement. And in about the fifth paragraph of the wedding announcement, it said, Ms. Hurst, Ms. Hurst is a undergraduate at the University of California at Berkeley. Emily Harris was a secretary at Berkeley at that time. And she knew, as a lot of people knew, that in that more innocent time, there was a big black binder that was open to the public. And it had the name and address of every student. So Bill Harris went to that big, big, back, big black binder and he said, and he looked up and he saw that she lived at 2603 Benvenue Street in Berkeley, apartment number four. So they staked her out and they started looking, you know, seeing her patterns and they saw <coughs> that Patricia Hearst led a very predictable life. What they didn't know is that Patricia Hearst was not happy with that life. She was engaged, but she was increasingly sick of Stephen Weed. She was estranged from her mother as well. And she was at a very restless and unhappy moment in her life, starting to develop a political consciousness. So on February 4th, 1974, Donald DeFries, Bill Harris, and uh, um, Angela Atwood knocked on the door of apartment four mumbled something about, you know, can you help us with our car? Stephen Weed opened the door and they stormed in and they grabbed Patricia. They hit Stephen Weed in the head and what did Stephen Weed do? He ran for his life outside the, <laughs> out, out the back door. They grabbed Patricia Hearst, they stuffed her in the trunk of the car, um, drove uh, around San, San Francisco Bay <clears throat> to Daly City, a, a blue collar suburb, and they put her in a closet and then they said to themselves, well, what the hell do we do now? Because <laughs> they really didn't have much of a plan for what to do. Um, there was this vague idea of trading her for these two hostages, for, the, for these two comrades of theirs, but they knew that wasn't going to work. Well, Bill Harris had an idea. What about some guerrilla theater? Why don't we get, instead of asking for ransom for ourselves, why don't we get um, old man Hearst, Randy Hearst, her father, to feed the poor of California. So they made, they made this demand that he put up millions of dollars to feed the poor. And Randy Hearst, he did it. He put up millions of dollars. And in a space of a couple of weeks, they set up this organization called People in Need. And they actually distributed a lot of food to the people of, uh, poor people in Northern California. It was not a very smooth process. They, there were some riots. In the meantime, Patty Hearst is in the closet, and she is, and the, and the closet door opens, and they start to talk to her, and they start to tell her, look, we're not out here to hurt you. We're all, the only people you have to fear are the FBI and the police. We're here to feed the poor. We're here to liberate um, uh, the oppressed. And one person in particular spent a lot of time talking to her, a guy named Willie Wolf, who was very much from the same social class as Patricia. 
He was the son of a physician from New Milford, Connecticut. He, he'd gone to prep school, he'd gone to Berkeley, and the two of them started to spend a great deal of time together. Now, it remains a dis point of contention about the precise nature of their relationship. The survivors in the SLA claim that the two of them fell in love. Patricia said she was raped by Willie Wolf. That remains ambiguous, and, and that's dealt with, you know, I deal with that in the book. But what's clear is that Patricia starts to become affiliated with, with the SLA. And on May, March 31st, just seven weeks after she's kidnapped, she issues a communique, a tape, a tape recording, which she says that she has decided to stay and fight, and she has taken the name, which I'm sure many of you remember, Tanya. Now, Tanya was Che Guevara's girlfriend in Bolivia who was killed with him. So, I mean, the, the name had a great resonance uh, in the counterculture. And on April 15th, the SLA had scouted a bank in, northern, uh, in, in a quiet part of San Francisco. And they wanted something in particular. They wanted a um, uh, new invention uh, to be in this bank, security camp. Uh, and th this bank had a security camera. So when they went inside this bank, they put Patricia right in front of where they knew the security camera would be with her machine gun. And she went in there and she participated in this bank robbery. And, and, and they, they got about $11,000 and it caused an enormous sensation. The heat started to get really bad on the uh, SLA in, <coughs> uh, in San Francisco. So the nine of them, there were, there were nine, Patricia and, and eight kidnappers, um, they all fled to Los Angeles, where Donald DeFries was from. And they, they rented a little house and they started to go a little stir crazy. So one day, May 16th, Patricia and Bill and Emily Harris, they decided to go shopping. So they, they, they take a van, the three of them, and they, um, uh, they go get some food, they go to a newsstand, and then they need some clothes, so they go to a place called Mel's Sporting Goods. And they park the van across the street from Mel's Sporting Goods, and Bill and Emily Harris go inside. Now, pause to think of what, what was, you know, Patricia Hurst is alone in this van, keysing in the ignition. She can drive away, she can walk away, she can call the police, she can go to a, get for help. She stays in the van. Bill and Emily Harris go inside and uh, start to shop. But Bill Harris, genius that he is, decides to shoplift. And uh, Emily, and, and just by coincidence, the clerk in the store is an aspiring police officer, Anthony Shepard. And Anthony Shepard knows that the crime of shoplifting does not take place until you actually leave the store. He saw Bill Harris stuffing stuff into his pockets, but he let Bill Harris leave the store and then he tackled them. And then Emily Harris jumped in. And there's a melee in front of Bill's, uh, Mel Sporting Goods. Now, what does Patricia Hurst do across the street where she's alone in the van? Does she do nothing? Does she drive away? No. She picks up a machine gun and sprays the front of Mel Sporting Goods with an entire magazine full of bullets, miraculously hurting no one trying to free her comrades. It doesn't work. She picks up another machine gun and does the same thing. This time it works, and Bill and Emily Harris um, escape from the clutches of Anthony Shepard, jump, jump into the van, and they drive off. Where do they go? Well, Emily Harris had had a summer job a few years <laughs> earlier at Disneyland. So they go to Disneyland. They go to a motel across the street from Disneyland and they turn on the television. And when they turn on the television, they see that the Los Angeles Police Department has surrounded the house with their six remaining comrades. They, loudspeaker, they say, come out, surrender. The SLA answers that with gunfire. What follows is, the, to this day, the biggest gun battle in American history between the police and a target. 5,000 rounds of ammunition go into that house, 3,000 rounds of ammunition come out. Ultimately, the house catches fire, 
and all six die inside. Donald DeFries, Willie Wolf, Angela Atwood, the whole lot of them are, are, are killed on live television. It's one of the first live broadcasts of a breaking news event ever, as Bill and Emily are watching, and, and Patricia are watching, and Patricia sees that the warning was true, that the only thing they really had to fear was the police, and the police, who clearly thought Patricia was inside, wiped them all out. What follows after that is what's known as Patricia's lost, Patty's lost year. She goes on the run for more than a year with Bill and Emily and other people they pick up along the way. They uh, commit an extraordinary number of crimes while they are on the run. They rob two more banks. In one of those bank robberies, a woman is killed. They, they set off bombs in Northern California, and ultimately on September 15th, 1975, more than a year and a half after the kidnapping, she is arrested. And she's tried for the original bank robbery, she's convicted, sentenced to seven years in prison, and uh, is, um, sent, begins serving her sentence. But Jimmy Carter uh, commutes her sentence after 22 months, and 20 years later, Bill Clinton gives her a full pardon. She is the only person in American history to receive a pardon, uh, a commutation from one president and a pardon from another, which when you consider the scope and the number of crimes she committed is a pretty extraordinary piece of testimony about the power of wealth and privilege in this country. So that's a quick review, somewhat quick, uh, of, uh, of the story, and uh, so I look forward to talking with Dan and with all of you about it. Like one of the first things that occurs to me is what prompted you to get into this book, and it wasn't, it wasn't Patty Hearst. No, it wasn't. I, I did a piece for The New Yorker in, um, I guess, two, three years ago now about this gang in Baltimore um, called this prison, I'm sorry, a jail in Baltimore that had been taken over by this gang called the Black Gorilla Family. And I got interested in the history of the Black Gorilla family. The Black Gorilla fa family was founded by George Jackson at Soledad Prison. And I got interested in this whole uh, uh, um, prison movement. And my editor actually said, well, doesn't the SLA come out? Of, you know, what about Patty Hearst? And I said, oh, there must be a million books about Patty Hearst. And I, he said, well, go check. And it turned out almost nothing has been written about Patty Hearst. Um, since, since the time of, 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 you know, when it was a breaking news event. So I decided to just sort of do soup to nuts, to, you know, re-report the whole thing. One of the things I found very interesting is one of your sources of information was kind of a bizarre source when you think about it. You, you bought the research materials from Bill Harris. Bill Harris, yeah. You know, Bill Harris, um, he, he, he served about seven years in prison for the kidnapping Patty Hearst. There was a long gap, and then he served several more years in connection with the bank robbery where the woman died. Uh, in between those two stints in prison, he worked as a private investigator. And, and actually, uh, a very good one from what, I, from, from what I've been told. And Bill is a sort of obsessive personality, and one of the things he tried to do during um, the time he was not in prison, was assemble all of the papers in connection with the SLA, all of the trial records, all of the FBI uh, interview notes. Every, you know, it turns out 150 boxes of material. Well, when I met Bill, uh, he had just had a deal to sell the, those boxes to a university library fall through. And you know, presented with this opportunity, I bought them instead, and I, th this was the real gold mine of research material for this book, and when I'm done, you know, now I'm done, I have to sort of pull it all together, I'm going to give it to the Harvard Law School Library where I have all my papers and, you know, let other people look at it and see what they make of it. You interviewed over 100 people. I did. And selfishly, I'm interested, who was the most interesting interview? Well, um... It's interesting. I mean, I gotta say, Bill Harris is a pretty interesting guy. Um, I, I, you know, I, I don't endorse his behavior, needless to say. I mean, just <laughs> to, to sort of, you know, anticipate a question of yours, um, one person who did not cooperate 
in any way was Patricia Hearst herself. And uh, I tried very hard to interview her um, you know, for obvious reasons. You'd want to talk to her for a book like this. And she didn't want to participate. And I think, um, now the good news is, her, her version of the facts is very much on the record. She wrote a book, she testified a bunch of times. So it wasn't like I didn't have her perspective, but you know, obviously you want to <clears throat> talk. I, I, the reason she didn't cooperate, I think, was twofold. One is she's 62 years old now. She's um, a widow. She married her bodyguard, as some of you may remember. He sadly died in 2013. Um, she's a mother of two daughters, a grandmother. Um, the, one of the most remarkable things about this whole story is that Patty Hearst wound up living the life for which she was destined. She was sort of a socialite, a ho homemaker, a few quirky interests. She was been in some movies, John Waters movies, but um, you know she sort of led the life for which she was destined. Now, um, and. and, and so this is, she's moved on. She doesn't want to talk about this anymore. She, her, her life is in a very different place. And I certainly respect <clears throat> that. She's given many interviews over the years, almost exclusively to people who don't know much about the facts of the case. She knew if she was going to talk to me, I was going to ask her about Mel Sporting Goods, about the other bank robberies. And I don't think she really wanted to get into that. So I think that's another reason why she didn't want to uh, answer my As question. a trial attorney, I was, I'm always intrigued with the important evidence. And as you know, um, with that same background, there was a paralegal who had a very small role, but she kind of connected the dots and showed that, that Patty's you know, coercion stuff didn't really make sense. You know, this, I, I'm so glad you asked about this because this is a part of the story I haven't had a chance to talk about in public much, but it really is uh, one of my favorite uh, sort of trial surprises. Um, the, the issue in the trial, as the issue has been in public about Patty Hearst from, the, from you know, as soon as she was arrested was, was she really a member of the SLA or was she coerced? That was the defense. Um, you know, I, I try to stay away from the words brainwashing and Stockholm syndrome. Those are journalistic terms, they're not medical terms, but obviously they have a great deal of, of resonance in this case. But the defense in this case was that she was coerced, that she never wanted to be a part of the, the SLA, and they made her rob banks, and, and, and she was operating under the fear of death. Well. The prosecutors were trying to deal with, how, how do you respond to that argument? Well, just by coincidence, at to very much towards the end of the trial, Bill and Emily Harris, who were awaiting trial, gave an interview to a then-in-existence magazine called New Times. And they were asked the question, well, how can you prove to us that Patty wasn't coerced? How can you prove that she really was involved with Willie Wolf and that she did love him and she wasn't you know, a, a, you know, wasn't a prisoner, she was a willing participant. Well, Emily Harris says to the two reporters, well, I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Willie Wolf wore at all times, he had been an archeology span student before he left school, he wore a little thing, charm called an Olmec monkey, a, a, a Mexican charm. And during his love affair with Patty, he gave Patty one of those uh, charms. And it was sort of a symbol of their love. And she carried it with her all the time. <clears throat> now, why would she carry it with her if, if she hated Willie Wolf? And he raped her. And, 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 and if he had raped her. Well, um, the paralegal on the, uh, the prosecution team, a young woman, said, you know, that's a good point. Why would she carry something with her uh, it, it, for a guy who had raped her, who hated, you know, whom she hated? So they, during the trial, they tell the FBI agent, go look in Patty's purse when she was arrested. See what was in it. So they like go to the evidence locker and they empty out the purse and they find the old McLunky that she was carrying with her in September of 1985, a year and a half later. And at the very end of the trial, the prosecution introduces the old McMonkey and they show that Willie Wolf, when he died, was wearing an old McMonkey around his neck. And they made the argument that why would Patty carry this with her if 
she hated Willie Wolf. And every juror <clears throat> said that was very persuasive evidence to them. And as a trial attorney, the bizarre thing about that is, and there's a heading of the chapter that talks about the McMonkey, because the, they heard about this old McMonkey, and it was O-L-M-E-C. It was a certain kind of Indian artifact. And the prosecutors totally missed it, but this woman caught the idea. That's right. The, 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 uh, the, the FBI agents were, like a lot of people in law enforcement, Irish. So they heard MC, capital K, you know, Mick, MC, M-O-N-K-E-Y. And when it was, in fact, O-L-M-E-C, uh, monkey. The, the book is, is fascinating because it's just such a contrast between these incredibly violent, I mean, scary people with, they had thousands of, of rounds of ammunition, they had machine guns, they bombed people, they made pipe bombs, but they were the gang that couldn't shoot straight. I mean, well, one story that um, I got a kick out of was they hold up with this, these people in this house, I think it's in LA, and they need a car, and so uh, sink you, Give some guy five hundred dollars to buy a car, and the guy takes off with the five hundred dollars. Right. No, I mean it, it, it was, and and you know the, the crazy stuff um, that happens. I mean, perhaps you're talking about my, you, you know, my favorite interview. I, I mentioned to you the, um, you know, the shootout at Mel's. You know, where, where they they you know have this Patricia shoots up the store and they take off. Well, they know that. Uh, they're, everybody's seen their van. So they, they need to get rid of the van and get another car. So they drive a few blocks, you know, they get out of, they, they get out of uh, um, the, the main line of traffic and they see a for sale sign in the, in the window of another van. And they knock on the door by the van and they say, is this, you know, can, can we take a test drive? And this 18-year-old guy named Tom Matthews comes out and says, sure, you know, I'll, I'll go along with you. And they, they, you know, Tom Matthews starts to drive the car and Bill Harris pulls out a machine gun and says, um, you know, we're taking the van and you're coming with us. And Tom Matthews says, well, okay, just as long as I'm back by tomorrow because I got a really important high school baseball game. <laughs> And what follows is they are with Tom Matthews for hours. They, they, they're trying to you know, f go to a rendezvous spot. They, they go to a drive-in movie together. He sits in the back with Patricia, and Patricia's telling him stories about how they robbed the other bank. And Tom Matthews is the most chill human being of all time. He's like, wow, it's like, this is really interesting. He's like, you're really Patty Hearst. And, and, you know, and, and he's just like, at one point, it goes on for so long, he falls asleep in the back. Um, ultimately, they let him out, and he, uh, he, made the game. he made the game, in which they won one nothing. I'm very pleased to say. And, and I tracked down Tom Matthews to, to interview him, and he is now a real estate broker in Kansas, and he's just as chill. And he was great. He was like, wow, yeah, it was wild, you know. It was, you know it was a, I just like to when, when I thought of that question, I was so hoping that Tom Matthews was the right answer because <laughs> you'll see in the book, he, he just says, as long as you don't shoot me, it's okay. And what happened was when they, when they got him for uh, shoplifting at Mel, the young clerk who was going to be a cop put a handcuff on him. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Put half a handcuff on him. And, on Bill Harris. Yeah, on Bill Harris. And so they're looking for a hardware store to to get something to cut it off. And this kid Matthews is helping him find the hardware store. <laughs> and Bill Harris is trying to saw this thing off and he's making it tighter and, and cutting off the circulation. So Tom Matthews comes in and says he cuts it off, but one proviso, he wants to have it as a souvenir and he still has it. He, he, kept, he, kept, the, he kept the shard of the handcuff as a souvenir, which I certainly would too. I mean, you know. Come on. But the book is, is amazing because you know the basic story and you think, okay, we've heard the story. And it's much like Jeff's other book about OJ. You know the story, but all the characters and stuff are, are just so fascinating. And I, I just go through a list of some of the characters that come through it. It reminds me of the Tim Robbins movie, The Player, where all these cameos by famous people, but these are real cameos. Sarah Jane Moore, a name that's shivering in Bellevue. 
She distributed food at the. the she food was stand. the bookkeeper for people in need for the organization. Uh, the week after Patty was arrested, Sarah Jane Moore came this close to assassinating Gerald Ford in San Francisco, uh, sh trying to shoot him um, in uh, by the San Francisco Hotel uh, in downtown San Francisco. I mean, there are all sorts of people who who come who. Uh, you know, sort of strange cameos in this book. You know, I mentioned um, the, uh, the, the three SLA members who were in the theater program at the Indiana University. Um, they performed in a number of plays with Kevin Klein, who is now, you know, a, a famous actor. Angela Atwood uh, was a sorority sister at Indiana University with Jane Pauley who, you know, later, you know, the anchor of the Today Show. I mean, just, be, they, they, they um, the SLA did their gun training at this place um, in, in the Berkeley Hills. Um, and, you know, it, it, at this, at the, at, at the shoot, shooting range, you're not allowed to use machine guns, but they did anyway. Once day, there was another young student who was shooting off, you know, his pistol at, at the shooting gallery? When he saw these people down the down the shooting line um, shooting machine guns, and they thought, and he said, "I'm going to get the hell out of here. I don't want to be around anybody with a machine gun." That student was Lance Edo, uh, later the judge in the OJ Simpson. Did you interview Lance? I did. I did interview Lance. Yes. Uh, how did he connect it? How did he know? That it was well, you know, it's it's funny how how stories. You know, when you're a journalist, you hear stuff like this all the time. Um, somebody told me, you know, there was like, says, did you know that Lance Edo lived in the house next door to Stephen Weed and Patty Hearst, and he was a witness to the kidnapping? And I thought, wow, well, that's pretty interesting. So I, you know, I, from my OJ connections, I know how to reach Lance Edo. I said, is that, is that true? He said, no, no, no. But I, that, you could sort of see how the story got garbled into... <clears throat> You know, he did have some connection with the SLA, but it wasn't that he lived next door. One of the tragic aspects of the book, and, and I guess Patty is very good at uh, telling her story with avoiding good journalists who are going to ask her tough questions. And she got Jimmy and Rosalind Carter, um, obviously Bill Clinton, John Wayne, Ronald Reagan, who was a very conservative guy, all to support her in her fight to. Uh, write her name, but the most interesting is probably Leo Ryan. Yes. The name well, that you recognize from some other. Well, and, and, and you know, Leo Ryan was a congressman from the, the, that part of Northern California, and the reason you may remember his name is that he represented the district where a lot of members of the People's Temple, Reverend Jim Jones' People's Temple, they went down to Guyana and uh, then later um, the day Leo Ryan was there um, the, Leo Ryan was shot and killed by Jim Jones people and then Jones directed them all to commit suicide uh, which they did they, they drank the poison Kool-Aid it's funny you know you hear people say you know so and so drank the Kool-Aid a lot of people don't even remember the origin of that phrase, you know, what that comes from, but it comes from uh, the, the, the People's Temple story. Now, um, why that story is doubly significant is that the People's Temple suicide, you know, mass suicide, took place at precisely the time Jimmy Carter was weighing whether to give a commutation to Patty Hearst. And she um, was... Um, uh, and and the, the subject of brainwashing was very much in the air. Everybody was saying, how can you persuade 900 people to commit suicide? They must be, they must be brainwashed. Likewise, Patty Hearst must be brainwashed. And, and, and it, it contributed to an atmosphere where uh, a, a commutation was a, was a more politically powerful thing. And John Wayne actually made that. John, know, John Wayne made that precise analogy. So it's like, well, you, if you can get these people to kill themselves, why can't you get a young girl to commit so, to commit bank robbery? So I've got to ask, and if you read when you read the book, you'll see that the most loathsome character in the book is is Weed, 
Did you interview Eve? I did. I, I, you know, I, it's funny. You know, once you send a book out in the world, you know, you never know exactly. You know, you, you uh, many people who have read the book said, "Oh God, Stephen Weave, what a jerk." Um, and you know, I can certainly understand that perspective. Uh, the the only thing that the FBI, the SLA, the Hearst family, and Patricia had in common was that they all couldn't stand Stephen Weave. <laughs> they, they, you know, he was sort of an arrogant guy, he was sort of pompous, you know, and you know, he was all of 23 years old, but you know, he was four years older than Patricia, and Patricia was only 19 when she was kidnapped, which is worth keeping in mind. Um, but, you know, Stephen, I, I don't think, he's not a bad guy. I mean, it just, you know, he, he and Patty Hearst, his erstwhile fiance, have never seen each other or spoken since February 1st, 4th, 1974. Um, and um, he, did, he was a philosophy graduate student. He did not become a philosopher. He is a real estate broker in Palo Alto. <laughs> Which is happens to a lot of philosophy. It, it, exactly. There's a, there's a better buck in a uh, real estate broker than uh, philosophers. Did, did the OJ book in that time period, did that feed into this book at all? You know, I, I mean, certainly they, 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 there are many connections uh, between them. I mean, certainly um, they are about, uh, in part, you know, how the media affects uh, coverage, you know, you know, an underlying event. You know, everybody said during the, the 70s, oh, the Patty Hearst case was so unbelievably publicized. You know, it, it was, it was, she was on the cover of Newsweek seven times. Now today, you say that to somebody and they'd say, what's Newsweek and what's a cover? Um, you know, the media was a much smaller entity in 1974. You know, there were three <coughs> evening news shows, a half an hour each. There was the Today Show, there wasn't even Good Morning America yet. So yes, it got a lot of publicity, but certainly nothing like O.J. Simpson where there was, you know, round the clock cable news coverage. And certainly nothing like today, where you would have the internet and social media. Um, I, I think the main, the main connection between the two is you know, my recognition, for better or for worse, that when there's a high profile case, what goes on in the courtroom is only part of the story. You know, the, the story of the O.J. Simpson case, as I see it, and certainly as my colleagues in FX who made the miniseries earlier this year saw it, was about the relationship between African Americans and the police. And that's how the defense, you know, what the defense turned it into, understandably. The, the um, Patty Hearst case was, was really about the disorder of the 70s and how she became <clears throat> a symbol of, you know, the kids who were getting away from, from the establishment. So, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, um, th those similarities uh, were certainly evident to me. And I think the time frame is, you read the book and you get a real flavor for the 70s. And we forget that Jeff mentioned that they went to the drive-in and watched several movies. The reason they did that is because they were gonna rendezvous if they got mixed up with their, their cohort, they were gonna rendezvous with the drive-in. Well, they went there waiting for the other people to show up and they, they took off, but today we think, well, why didn't they use their cell phone? But there was no cell phones back then. Right, well, they, yeah, they, they couldn't reach the other six. You know, that, 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 and then, that, the, that's right, <coughs> they, they set up this rendezvous point, um, and, and they, you know, I, you know, I've been to one drive-in in my life, and they, 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 they have these speakers, and, and they put a cup upside down, and that was the symbol that they were there waiting for them. <laughs> like a lot of things, yes, they were, it didn't work out. With respect to the media, too, I think there's a number of ironic things, and I don't know if you mentioned it earlier or not, but um, this was the first time ever that something was broadcast live without being planned, the first minicamp. Right, yeah. The, 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 um, before the, the mid-70s, um, if, if television wanted to broadcast an event live, they had to lay cable. So, you know, political conventions, World Series games, you know, you could plan for it. But KNXT was a local station in, in, in Los Angeles. They bought um, a truck which had a satellite dish on top 
which could transmit live from a breaking news event. And they had just gotten it. And KNXT prided itself on um, technological innovation. NXT stood for Experimental Television. So that, and, and the, the station is currently, is now called KCBS. It's the CBS affiliate in Los Angeles. But they sent a truck to the, the place where the standoff was going on at 54th Street in Los Angeles. And, and uh, what happened was KNBC, their rivals came and, and basically threatened to destroy the signal. They, they, they couldn't send out their own signal, but they could break up KNXT's signal. So KNXT made a deal. They said, you can, don't break up our signal, but you can have it too. You can share it. Well, as the shootout began, other stations started picking it up. And then other stations around the whole country started to pick it up. So this became the first breaking news event covered live uh, in, uh, in the whole country. Yeah. Now I'll ask one more obscure question, then we'll take questions from the audience. But I don't know where you came, came across the fact that KNXT was tied to Mary Tyler Moore's uncle and yeah, you know, it's, it's interesting, my colleague... And the Ted Baxter character. Yeah, my, my colleague at... Um, at uh, this actually came from him. Uh, my, my colleague at CNN, Jim Murphy, who was the executive producer of our morning show, um, you know, when he was a kid, worked at, um, worked at KNXT, and he knew all the people who were involved in, you know, making this breaking news event. And he said, you know, the most famous thing about KNXT is that Mary Tyler Moore's aunt was the business manager there. And she used to watch Jerry Dunphy, who was the anchor man, uh, who was basically a clown and, and who just read what was on the teleprompter, who didn't know anything about anything. And she used to tell Mary about this crazy anchor man. Well, Jerry Dunphy turned out to be the model for Ted Baxter from the Mary Tyler Moore Show, which is one of those things I put in the book because, you know, I just couldn't resist. Right? <laughs> it's a great fact. So, you want to take some questions? Yeah. Just raise your. We have a. You don't have to yeah. stand on ceremony yeah. here. Yeah. I'm curious where the funding came from. What, what, how did how did they survive for that year? Well, the, 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 the answer is they they barely did. They had almost <clears throat> no money. Um, at one point, um, they were sort of adopted by this guy, Jack Scott, who was this colorful, uh, sort of interesting combination of a, of a social activist and a journalist who wanted to get them to write a book about their experiences. So he actually hid them in a, in a house, in a farmhouse in Pennsylvania for a while uh, until they got sick of him. But, the reason they robbed banks is they needed money. Um, they, they didn't have any money. I mean, you know, one of the things that you know people often ask also is like, were they on drugs? And you know, they couldn't afford drugs even if they wanted them. I mean, they really just had no money. They were living off like black eyed peas and and you know chicken parts. I mean, they had very very little money. There was not. Um, the, 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 this was not a heavily bankrolled opposite, uh, operation. And the amazing thing about this Jack Scott guy is he was a kind of a medium maniac and he wanted to be in the, the front and center. Um, he was roommates with Bill Walton, who right. the, the basketball was a basketball player. player. It just these the, connections the just get more more and more bizarre. Yeah. Yes. Why did they engage in the shootout? I mean, when they all got killed. I mean, was it desperation? You know, that's, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think by that point, SinQ had become, I'm sorry, Donald DeFries, as you may remember, renamed himself General Field Marshal SinQ. Of he, people. He had become um, very fatalistic and very sort of messianic about his role. And, um, but of course they should have surrendered. It, may, it, may, it makes no sense, but you know, they, they, they had, you know, but this is the same group of people that assassinated Marcus Foster. So it wasn't like they didn't specialize in rational thought. <laughs> but um, of course, they they should have they should have surrounded. Another contrast of bizarre behavior. There's this unbelievable shootout. The police, five thousand rounds of ammunition. They shoot three thousand out. 
and they have, they have come to this house in this terrible neighborhood, and they've just kind of taken over the house. The people that live there are very much ne'er-do-wells. Right. And they stumble in drunk. Uh, the police with the bullhorn say, come out. And a little while later, I think after the fighting, Christine Johnson, I believe her name was, stumbled out. So she, she woke she, up. She slept through <laughs> thousands of rounds. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, in the Jack Ritter book, you mentioned the Stockholm Syndrome, and you mentioned it earlier tonight. Was that part of the defense that they used? You know, it's interesting that you ask that. The Stockholm Syndrome is based on a bank robbery that took place in Stockholm, Sweden, in um, November of 1973, just three months before the kidnapping. It had not yet seeped into the popular culture yet, just for you, those of you. What happened in the bank robbery is that the, the bank robbers took some hostages, and the hostages wound up taking the side of the kidnappers against the authorities. And it's become shorthand for people who identify with their, you know, their oppressors. <clears throat> uh, because it was so soon after the, uh, you know, so soon before the kidnapping, it was never mentioned in the trial. It was just not something that was in the brainwashing was mentioned in the trial. Uh, you know, Stockholm Syndrome it is not a real medical phenomenon. It is true that some people who are, you know, taken captive identify with their captors. Some don't. It is not a universal phenomenon. It is not a, a medically recognized phenomenon. It is true it sometimes happens. So I prefer to describe Patricia's behavior in terms of what she actually did, rather than, um, you know, applying labels to it. I mean, my own view is that you know she reacted rationally to her surroundings as a restless young woman. She she saw that um, you know the, the 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 SLA was being good to her and being and and you know fighting for truth and justice as they as they saw it. And later, after she's arrested, she saw that, you know, when she, the day she was arrested, um, she was, you know, asked her pedigree information, uh, you know, name, address, occupation, and she gave her occupation as urban gorilla, <laughs> which was accurate. But, you know, in short order, she said, like, to hell with this urban gorilla thing, I want to go back with my rich parents. <laughs> that, too, was a rational decision. So I think that's a more useful frame of seeing her behavior than you know Stockholm syndrome or brainwashing. Did you interview F. Lee Bailey? Uh, at Great Life, yes. He's not very happy with me. <laughs> um, he's another person who's been a real neat meal ticket of mine. Anyway, yes. Uh, how was she actually or ultimately arrested? Well, I mean, again, in the craziness of this story, I told you that Jack Scott uh, sheltered them in, in this farmhouse for a while. Um, Jack Scott had a brother who was an alcoholic and a soldier of fortune. Typical profession, right? And one day he stumbled drunkenly into the FBI office in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which was somewhat near this farm, and said, you know, my, my uh, uh, brother sheltered the SLA. And they further, they said, get out of here, you drunk. No, 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 go. So they actually, they went to the farm and they took fingerprints and they saw, they found Patty Hearst and Bill Harris. Is her. So they knew they had been in this farm. So they, they started investigating people in Jack Scott's circle. And these were the people who were sheltering Pat, Patty. And, and it was basically through the Jack Scott connection that, that they, found, they found Patty. But, you know, it took a long time, a year and a half. I remember when, um, when she was captured, and I remember that there was something about her reading something in a photocopy machine in a library. Do you, did, you, did you research this stuff? <clears throat> something like it was really easy to make a fake ID in those days, getting a library card. Well, they had a lot, of, I mean, they, they had a tremendous number of fake IDs. Bill Harris, uh, when his wife was working at the, uh, um, at, at, um, as a secretary at Berkeley, Bill worked at the post office, and he used to steal you know, all sorts of IDs. I don't remember, I don't remember anything about a, a Xerox machine, but you're right that they use, and, and you know, I mean, this is again, one of the you know, key facts about all this is that, you know, Patty had so many opportunities to, to, to escape or turn himself in. She, she, as she later acknowledged, 
she, she disputes that she ever fell in love with Willie Wolf, but she acknowledged that she fell in love with this guy, Steve Solia, who she was living with, another SLA member at the time that she was arrested. Steve Solia, they used to go hiking. Once they went hiking and they got caught on a cliff that they couldn't escape from. They, 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 so the state police came and threw them a rope to, to you know, pull them out. She gave a, you know, she had a fake ID to give, I mean, she could have said to the state police, I'm Patty Hearst, you're going to take me out. Uh, another time with Steve, they were hiking and she got poison oak, a terrible case of poison oak. She goes to the hospital. She gives the same fake name to the hospital to get treatment for poison oak. So, I mean, she, they, they had a lot of fake IDs. I don't, the, the, the Xerox machine is not. But I think I mean, there, might, there was a lot of documentary evidence that was found in one of the houses that they lived in, they had the brilliant idea of, let's just burn the house down so there'll be no evidence in it, but they forgot that they need oxygen to make a fire go and handle the windows closed, so the, nothing got burned up and the police found all kinds of evidence. Right, that was, that was right before she was kidnapped, yes. Um, did I hear you say that the police thought that Patty Hearst and the Harrises were in the house? Absolutely. The shootout? Yes. So it's just interesting that here's this kidnapped person, and they're just blasting away. Well, this was the LAPD. I mean, you're right, you know, and 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 you know, it's it's an interesting um, illustration of the difference between the San Francisco police and the Los Angeles police. You know, the LAPD didn't have to fire five thousand rounds of ammunition into that house. They could have waited them out. They had just invented something called the Special Weapons and Tactics Unit (SWAT). And which you know then became famous. Uh, this was the LAPD. This was how the LAPD operated. They they were a shoot first and ask questions later operation, and and it, it had a very profound effect on Patty, understandably, because it was quite clear they thought she was inside, and they fired away anyway. So we know Americans have always used crime and criminals as forms of entertainment. Was that the case here? Or I'm sorry to say, what was that? Was the public fed up with her? As a well, I mean, I, I think, you know, what was interesting about the politics of the situation was that she went from being the perfect victim, you know, the innocent college girl grabbed off, to being a symbol of how the society was spinning out of control. That even, you know, a wealthy heiress kidnapped could become a counterculture figure. And, 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 and the public sort of turned against her at, at, at that point.